Yeah, let me just reiterate uh, something he said. Uh, questions. You may there's a lot of great information up there. Uh, if you're thinking about your business or where your business is headed this year and in 2016, and I wish he would have addressed this. Well, write down your question, and there'll be people coming up and down the aisles on the side there, and just pass them down, and we will um, be sure and get those questions addressed uh, during the Q&A. Okay, um, we are pleased to have attorney Rich Sanders back again this year. Rich has a large area of legal expertise, including business transactions, fraud and abuse compliance, issues involving certificates of need, medical staff credentialing, Medicare reimbursement, antitrust policy, legislative activity, and assisting providers in their relationship with federal and state regulatory agencies. It's clearly an important issue. Today, Rich will be specifically addressing the impact which the ACA is having on employers who provide health insurance to their employees. Rich Sanders. I thought when he said, when he said uh, Rich has a large area, he was referring to how much space I consume on that tiny little stairway. <laughs> it's so good to be back at the Hall County Chamber. Thank you, Kit, for inviting me to uh, return. This is my fourth year um, speaking to y'all, and I look forward to it every year because this is one of the few places where I get to speak about healthcare reform across the country where regular people are in the audience. And, and by that, I mean, uh, not physicians necessarily, not hospital administrators necessarily, but small business owners and citizens. And so in my comments today about healthcare reform, I hope to address some aspect of healthcare reform as it affects each of you, not just individually, but in the ways that you wear different hats and come to this meeting today to learn more about healthcare reform. There's some component of everybody in this room that is a citizen or a taxpayer or a small business owner, or a provider of health services, or a recipient of health services. And each one of those facets of those hats that you wear has been affected by healthcare reform, not just in the past five years, but within the last year. And so I hope that uh, I can build upon the, the previous three years that I've spoken to you all about healthcare reform implementation and give you a, some um, inkling of what this means for you. So let me start off with some great news that happened in the last year. Northeast Georgia Medical Center has a pet park. <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> it's good news. Um, I have to say pet park, I have to say pet park, uh, Brett mentioned, you know, I was going to talk about the same-sex marriage decision from the Supreme Court. Not going to go there. But uh, I am going to talk about the pet park in a way that does not offend cats. If you talk about it, <laughs> In terms of a dog park, the cats just get bent out of shape. <laughs> but I mentioned the pet park at Northeast Georgia, everybody, because um, I, my good friend, Steve Mc McNeely, who's going to be speaking with you later on today, and I had a meeting at the hospital last week, and I was lost. Hospital's a big place. It's changed a lot uh, in the last five years, and I couldn't find him. It was one of those things where we're texting each other, and I'm saying, where are you? And he's saying, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get together until I finally found him right near the pet park. And along that walkway, for those of y'all who uh, visit the hospital on a regular basis, please look out for this. It's near the Women and Children's Pavilion. Along that walkway, some bright-minded individual has painted paws on the sidewalk. And when I finally found Steve, I said, well, that would have been a good landmark to point out. <laughs> um, and, but the point is that he, neither he nor I knew it was there. And so I hope, not only in the course of my time with you this morning, but throughout our day today, we'll give you some pause on the sidewalk that you can look at in the future to figure out what all this means for you and where it's going. From a lawyer's point of view, the issue is multifaceted. The way healthcare reform is affecting America involves five different kinds of uh, entities. The first, of course, being the government, who got the ball rolling in 2010. Health plans, as Brett already talked about, there's a lot of activity not only in terms of how health plans relate to each other and the consolidation we're seeing in that market, but in the way health plans relate to our other uh, two major categories, patients and providers. 
And then, of course, finally, the reason you're all here, the fifth facet of healthcare reform implementation. What does it mean for employers? So we're going to try and address each of those facets during my time um, with you all today. But first of all, uh, it, it makes sense to take a brief look back. This is August of 2015, and so for those of us who have followed the law, not just from its uh, passage and signature by the president, uh, but in the buildup towards the law, 2015 is an important year. Uh, this is the fifth anniversary of the passage and signature of the law by the president in a big ceremony in the Rose Garden on March 23rd of 2010. At that time, the, the looking forward uh, that Congress did in passing the law and that the administration was really hoping to accomplish was laid out in a series of years. Those years started last year. January 1st of 2014 was a major kickoff point. The exchanges opened a quarter early. They opened up in October of 2013. But open enrollment year one of 2014, open enrollment year two, which we concluded earlier this spring, we're now halfway to what Congress and the administration thought back then. We're now halfway to where they thought we should be. In other words, the trajectory of healthcare reform implementation back then only includes two more years, open enrollment three, open enrollment four, and then we're kind of off off the chart. Even Congress with its crystal ball back in 2010 knew it could only plan for two more, uh, two more kind of sets of, of four year periods. And so 2018 is kind of a big question mark. This year was significant for, among other things, the Supreme Court decision uh, that came out the same week as the one regarding same-sex marriage. And that's where the Supreme Court got a chance to issue its opinion yet again on the constitutionality of the health reform law. In this case, uh, back in the first week of July, the court ruled one more time that the PACA, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act of 2010, is constitutional, and the way that the Obama administration is implementing it is allowed within the law. As you all know, because there were tons of articles, lots of media coverage on this back in June, the main uh, focus in Georgia was that because the federal government runs our exchange in Georgia, and people receive subsidies through that exchange in Georgia, that if the lawsuit was successful, it threatened the ability of Georgians to continue to receive that subsidy. And so more than 400,000 people who'd gotten their health insurance and received a subsidy had that somewhat endangered. Well, as you all know, the Supreme Court came out with a decision that said, nope, this is just fine. And as a result, state governments like Georgia across the union have said, okay, this is good news for our citizens and one less thing for us to worry about. It's important though to note, as we continue forward in years three and four of health reform implementation, that the state of Georgia continues to refrain from assisting the federal government in operation of the health insurance exchange. While many states around the country have looked at the Supreme Court decision since July and taken another approach or, or asked the question, should we take another approach in the way that our exchange is run, uh, Georgia's government seems quite satisfied to let the uh, federal government continue to operate it. So the good news is from the Supreme Court decision that the subsidies will continue. Uh, from Atlanta, we have a consistent message of we're fine letting the feds do it. That's important because in some states, in meetings like this, the discussion is, what does it mean for us that we're transitioning from a federally operated exchange to a state-based exchange? And that's causing employers and individuals who buy their insurance there a lot of concern. In addition, the state of Georgia is continuing um, to, uh, I guess, uh, continuing to maintain its position that Medicaid won't be expanded here. Uh, Medicaid expansion kind of came onto uh, the scene when the law got passed in 2010, and then when the Supreme Court made its decision in uh, June of 2012 that Medicaid expansion was going to be voluntary based on the desire of the states, only about half the states expanded their Medicaid programs at that time. Georgia did not and continues to uh, maintain both in the governor's office, Governor Deal is, is consistent in saying no Medicaid expansion, as well as the legislature. There are really smart people who argue about this almost every day in our state, y'all. Uh, governor has uh, not only his budget staff, but consultants who say Medicaid expansion is too expensive for Georgia. And that based on the way the federal government um, has the expansion rules set, if Georgia were to expand its Medicaid program in 2016, by 20, um, 
26, so 10 years down the road, the impact on Georgia's budget would be $4 billion. And Governor Deal's response to that is twofold. Number one, we don't have it now. And number two, we're not going to have it then. And if we're not going to have it then, that puts us in a situation of passing a law or implementing a policy to expand Medicaid that would violate the state's constitution. The response from that, from just as equally smart, intelligent economists, including uh, a good number of economics and healthcare policy professors at Georgia State, are saying Governor Deal and the administration has it all wrong. That instead of, of costing $4 billion over 10 years, it's only going to cost $2 billion over 10 years. And oh, by the way, the economic impact of expanding Medicaid in Georgia will boost the economy by $30 billion. So there's still a lot of argument going on about Medicaid expansion in Georgia. The Supreme Court decision from this past um, July did nothing to change that debate. And uh, we continue on with providers like the Hospital Association, the Medical Association of Georgia, calling for Medicaid expansion, but the government being kind of resolute in saying we're not going to expand Medicaid here. The interesting aspect of that, though, as we take a look at how health insurance and health insurance coverage have changed since 2010. The interesting aspect of that is without a formal decision to expand Medicaid in Georgia, Georgia Medicaid's growing like a weed. So let's talk about how this works in our state. With the decision by the state government back in 2012 to say we're not going to um, operate our own exchange and we're not going to expand Medicaid in Georgia, the wheels uh, started to um, grind into motion and our exchange opened in uh, October of 2013. Since then, through the end of this past open enrollment period, which was this past winter, now over half a million Georgians have, have enrolled in qualified health plans through our exchange, over half a million Georgians. The Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a nonpartisan objective think tank that studies health policy, Kaiser says that that's just about half of all the eligible people who can buy health insurance in our state. So in other words, there are about a million people who are uninsured and eligible by health insurance on the Georgia exchange, about half of them have done so. And so in one regard then, we can look at that as a real success in our state. Uh, the, the other aspect of that, though, is that when folks find out that they're not eligible to buy health insurance on our exchange, in many, in many cases, they're referred over to the Department of Community Health and the Medicaid office to see if they're eligible for Medicaid and are finding that they are. I read a study from this time last year, which I had not had a chance to see updated before today's presentation, a study from last August showed that Georgia Medicaid in increased by nearly 300,000 people after open enrollment year one. We can only assume that that number likewise increased. So we're looking at not just people getting more insurance in Georgia because of their purchase of health insurance uh, policies on the exchange, but we're seeing that more people are getting enrolled on Georgia Medicaid after they get to the exchange and find out they're not eligible. The total sum then is that nearly a million people have gotten health insurance in Georgia as a result of uh, the implementation of the health reform law. At a bigger national level, when Congress passed the law back in 2010, the estimates were, were pretty consistent that back then, 2010, there were 44 million people uninsured. When Congress passed the law, it had two things in mind trying to get that number of uninsured down to something manageable and controllable, and number two, trying not to spend too much money to do so. The Congressional Budget Office was under a lot of pressure back in the winter of 2010 to get an estimate of the cost of the implementation of the law that would be below a trillion dollars. And the final version of the law that was passed by Congress and signed by the President in March cost, according to the Congressional Budget Office estimate at that time, 960 billion, 960 billion would it be, right? Since then, in the, in the spring of 2011, the Congressional Budget Office revised its estimate and said, well, we got it a little wrong. It's going to be more like 2.2 trillion. <laughs> I'm like, only a weatherman can be that far off. Are you kidding? <laughs> the real cost is, uh, is going to be measured ultimately in trillions. But when Congress passed the law and said, okay, we want to really tackle the number of uninsured in our country, the goal was 33 million. 33 million newly insured by 2017 the end of open enrollment year four. So how are we doing as a nation? And from our perspective as taxpayers, are we getting our money's worth? 
Well, according to the president, in a celebration at the, uh, of the fifth anniversary of the passage of the law back in March and the end of open enrollment year two, we're just about on track. The Department of Health and Human Services says that there are 16 million people who are newly insured as a result of implementation of the law. 16 million newly insured. More than half have gotten their insurance off the exchange. Just a little less than half have gotten their insurance through becoming enrolled in Medicaid. I think it's significant, by the way, when we talk about how's Georgia compared to doing to other states. Medi-Cal is the program, the Medicaid program in the state of California. A million and a half people enrolled on Medi-Cal in the last two years. Isn't that something? When you think about the impact of California's economy on the rest of the United States, that's a factor that's worth putting in the back of your head because California has such an important sway over the rest of the nation uh, that it's gonna be noteworthy and interesting to watch how that percentage of the population there who's enrolled in Medi-Cal is gonna affect the rest of the state's economy. So uh, we have just over 8 million people newly insured on the exchange, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, just under 8 million people who've gotten a, uh, Medicaid uh, uh, eligibility and enrollment since then. And that's without about half the states who have refused to expand their Medicaid programs. So we're just about halfway there. The goal by 2017 is to have 33 million people insured and covered by health insurance policies. There's only a couple of factors that are gonna keep us away from um, achieving that goal. I'm gonna talk about them now as we look at what this all means for individual patients, what this means for enrollees, and frankly, the employees that work in your offices and in your companies. Georgia has one of the highest percentages of subsidies in the United States. When those half a million people went to the exchange in open enrollment year two, about half of those folks were newly insured, according to the Department of Health and Human Services. About 250,000 people are buying insurance for the first time. 91%, 91% or about 450,000 people required a federal subsidy to go buy that health insurance. 91%. The average subsidy, right? So we line up 10 people who go buy health insurance on the exchange in Georgia, nine out of 10 needed a federal subsidy to do so, fine. The average subsidy was 72 cents on the dollar. So just imagine, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a can of Coke or something. Let's see, ma'am, you got a coffee cup. Would you mind holding up your coffee cup for us? Just hold it up nice and high like the Statue of Liberty, right? So let's say, I'm going to focus on you for just a second. I'm not picking on you. This will be fun. All right. Let's say that that cup of coffee costs a dollar, and you're the manufacturer of that coffee. All right. What does it mean to you that nine out of ten of your customers need a federal subsidy to buy that cup of coffee? What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you that if you're charging a dollar, if you're charging a dollar, nine out of ten people get that dollar to include 72 cents from the federal government. Thank you, ma'am. That's a great illustration. <laughs> what does it mean? Well, from my perspective, we can kind of clearly see the dynamic through Brett's presentation. Health insurance companies are consolidating at a rapid pace. And uh, unless I missed something, brother, I didn't see a single health insurance company in Georgia that had lowered its rates this year. <laughs> So consolidation and price increases, that's one component of this. The other, the other is that with these heavy subsidies, um, we can anticipate um, the health insurance companies increasing their rates in order to try and get as much uh, profit as they can. When you think about a health insurance plan that costs uh, on a given month for an average 40-year-old living in Hall County, let's say it's cost $500 a month. That's about right. I think it's 492 for uh, the 2016 rates. Let's just round up for $500 to make it easy. That guy who's buying health insurance from Hall County then is going to pay $500 a month on paper, but the federal subsidy, if the averages apply, mean that he's actually going to get about 350 from the federal government. So his out of pocket is 150. That's good news for him. That means he's getting health insurance. As, uh, and it's an acronym from Brett's presentation, one that y'all are probably well familiar with by now, but it does make, um, I think, sense to point it out one more time. A qualifying health insurance plan is good insurance. 
all right? It's not catastrophic. It covers the waterfront of the services that we all would like to receive as patients and that as employers, we all want our employees to get everything from preventive care to end of life care and a lot in between. So this guy's coming out of pocket for 150 a month, very reasonable rate for many of us, for many of us, but those policies have a few strings attached. We'll get to that in just a second. The, one of the reasons that people were uh, so concerned across the country that the Supreme Court might ultimately end these subsidies is that that component of you know, the out-of-pocket would grow uh, to cover the amount that was not subsidized and people would just not be able to afford their insurance in the future. So now we know that these subsidies are, uh, are so significant that it really is what allows many people to afford health insurance in the first place. And what's noteworthy for y'all as you plan ahead in the future of your business and what it means for you, I think it's a great question that Brett asked, how many small employers are we seeing move from group health insurance to individual uh, markets? One thing to be careful to note is that when the government uh, passed the law, the federal government passed the law back in 2010, as I mentioned, it projected out its growth plan for open enrollment years one, two, three, and four, concluding in the winter of 2017. After that, there is no game plan in the law for subsidizing health insurance policies. There is no game plan in the law for health and subsidizing health insurance policies. They are wildly popular, as you might imagine. And I think it's fascinating just watching how people are surveyed in the American public. Gallup put out a poll right after the Supreme Court decision, so call it mid-July of this year, asked two questions. What do you think of the Supreme Court decision ensuring that uh, subsidies will be allowed to continue? 68% said, we love it. <laughs> All right, that's great. Next question down in the Gallup survey. What do you think of the PACA? What do you think of health reform law? 46% said, we don't like it. <laughs> All right, so how do you jive those two things? I, I think the, the only way that those two uh, numbers make sense is that people like entitlements when they're receiving them and that there's still a high level of misunderstanding and ignorance about what health care reform means for folks uh, as they go forward. All right? that, I think those are the two conclusions uh, that you can, can draw. What does it mean for, um, for the manufacturers of the coffee cup? Uh, what does it mean for the health plans? Well, this consolidation and this continual um, increase in rates, I think, is only going to continue. And the other factor that I'm so glad that Brett pointed out in his introductory comments this morning is that health plans are leaving the market, too. I think we're going to continue to see that trend develop, not only the consolidation of the bigger plans, but that other uh, companies, uh, Assurance is a, a terrific example, or just kind of, if it's a game of poker among health plans, they're pushing uh, their chair away and saying, that's enough for us. We're going to go do something else. All right. So having said that then, where does that leave us uh, in, in terms of looking at how this law is ultimately achieving its goals? The coverage, as I mentioned, the coverage is uh, doing just great. If the goal is to cover 33 million people by the end of 2017, we're about halfway there. Although I should say, just in fairness, because I want to be as objective as possible, there's a lot of controversy in those numbers. Um, Y'all may remember this time last year, I guess that's right, this time last year, um, the, the president was get, uh, getting heavily criticized for having said, if you like it, you can keep it um, with regard to health insurance. Y'all remember him saying that? Now that I think about it, that was two years ago. Uh, the reason it was so controversial is that um, right about the time the exchanges opened up in October of 2013, millions of Americans received letters saying, dear so-and-so, your um, health insurance plan is getting canceled. We welcome you to go buy another plan from us on the exchange or reach out to your health insurance um, agent to uh, buy one from us in a different way. The Sanders family got one of those letters. Ultimately, um, we wrote back and said, we don't think that's right. We're grandfathered, and it turns out we were. But there's still an open question about how many people got those letters. Uh, the president and the Secretary of Health and Human Services say that about 5 million people got those letters, but in the end, only 500,000 remained uninsured after all the deck chairs had been rearranged. And I try and be um, very open in gathering news to report to y'all and be as objective as possible. And so that means I watch Anderson Cooper and Sean Hannity. <laughs> all right. 
I also try and read as much as I can nationwide. And so my, my most kind of liberal source for news and information is the Los Angeles Times. And the Los Angeles Times wrote about this back in 2013 and said, we estimate that five million people got these letters. All right, so let's take five million as our, our kind of one end of the spectrum. Sean Hannity, in the same week, using a source that I still haven't figured out, uh, Sean Hannity said 14 million people got those letters. So let's just find the truth in the middle somewhere and say nine million people got those letters, all right? Nine million people at some point got a letter from their health insurance company back in 2013 saying, we're just not gonna sell you this policy anymore. Uh, the question is then, how many people of the eight million who have bought health insurance on the exchange, how many of them were previously insured as opposed to previously uninsured and now newly insured? There is no data on that. So as we look at this as taxpayers then and say, boy, we've really accomplished some things. You know, if the president's right and there are 16 million people who have health insurance now as a result of health reform implementation, that's great news. But what does it mean for us as a country trying to accomplish the goal of getting more health insurance um, to, uh, to residents of the United States and to their citizens? Well, then we gotta go back to kind of the most recent numbers on the uninsured and survey after survey puts that right about 13%, that we're at an all time low since health insurance coverage has been measured and determining how many we have uninsured in the United States has been measured. We're at an all time low, we're right about 12 and a half, 13%. So that's good news. Of course, our population is increasing pretty rapidly. And with about 300 million people in the United States, just some rough math, that puts us in an uninsured rate of about 33, 36 million. So we still got a long way to go. And, and then as taxpayers, the question is, what happens after 2017? Do we uh, end up having subsidies continue and the cost of this entitlement program goes forward? I don't know, you may just have to ask President Clinton Of course, after 2017 and the, and the end of the subsidies and the rollback of this entire program to, um, to the dismay of some and to the joy of others, you may just ask to have President Trump what he thinks about all this. And so we're never far from politics in discussion of, of anything. I can't believe I just said President Trump with a straight face, by the way. <laughs> As I've told y'all year after year, I try and play it straight down the middle, not partisan, not pro-Democrat, not pro-Republican, but the fact that Donald Trump is, has a double-digit lead over the next closest Republican nominee is a real surprise, and I think a joy. This is why America is such a great country. Um, but having said that, um, having said that, uh, I studied and researched and could not, not find any specific proposals from candidate Trump regarding uh, health reform or health reform implementation, other than it seems to be all the Republican uh, candidates are in lockstep. They want to get rid of the PACA. My sense is that is a political statement, not necessarily a policy statement, because Republicans see the name, same numbers that I do, and that is that their constituents who are receiving these subsidies to go buy health insurance really like them. Today's news, in fact, from the Washington Post has, a, has an article that just says Republican candidates are struggling to figure out what to do if they can repeal the PACA after the 2016 election. Let's just spend a, a moment on that. What would it take for the PACA to be repealed? Assuming that the Republican candidates look aside from their constituents who really like the subsidies and heavily support it, what would it take for that to happen? Well, currently the Senate is Republican majority. The House is Republican majority, and they have already repeatedly called for the repeal of the entire ball of wax. The president has consistently said, don't even bother passing a legislation or a bill uh, to repeal the PACA. I'm going to veto it the second it hits my desk. And so the only way that health reform will have any significant damage done to it from a legal perspective is if the Republicans hold on to the majority in the Senate and the majority in the House in next year's federal elections and a Republican president is elected. In that event, the inauguration will be in January of 2017, and likely one of the first things that happens after the inauguration is Republican leaders from the House, Senate, and White House will get together and figure out how to dismantle this. The early indications are, and, and y'all, they've been talking, they, the Republicans, have been talking about this since this winter, when the threat of King versus Burwell, that Supreme Court decision was kind of looming overhead, what do we propose instead? It's not, it's not uh, um, been talked about publicly. 
out of deference to the Supreme Court, uh, the Republicans did not put out any kind of game plan post King versus Burwell that said the subsidies cannot continue, and so they never saw the light of day. No Republican candidates are currently saying, here's what I would do instead with regard to health care reform. It's all, let's repeal the PACA. And so from a political perspective, uh, the, the Republican strategy is still appears to be developing, while the Democratic strategy is much more clear. Hillary Clinton has said repeatedly throughout the summer, if she is elected president, then she will do everything she can con to continue implementation of the PACA and work with a uh, Congress that is likely to be still Republican Senate still Republican House, and so we'll have kind of the relationship that we have um, between the executive uh, and um, legislative branches right now, which is somewhat of gridlock. Uh, and so um, <laughs> it is, I think, noteworthy that in addition to the Supreme Court decision that we just heard about earlier this year, and we thought as lawyers, okay, well, this is it for challenges to the PACA. Here comes one more. Here comes one more. Uh, one of my children, I'm blessed to have three, one of my children is an eighth grader and has a test in U.S. history today on the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the three branches of federal government. I hope that he doesn't get a question about this issue. Uh, it turns out, though, under our Constitution that the legislative branch can sue the executive branch. Who knew? Who knew? The House of Representatives, had, under Republican control, has sued the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and that lawsuit is now in federal court. Uh, the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post reported this week that through amending the complaint to tighten it up a bit and be more specific, now House Republicans have a pretty good shot at getting this lawsuit to continue forward. So our own government is suing itself. Isn't that interesting? I mean, from a constitutional lawyer's perspective, it's fascinating. From the American people's perspective, it's like, <sighs> Can't we get them to go to the dog park and hang out? <laughs> Sorry, pet park. So what's that mean? Well, the basis of that lawsuit is a little different than the one that we just resolved on the subsidy issue. That lawsuit is, um, is based on the House of Representatives saying that the executive branch, the Obama administration, improperly spent billions of dollars on health plan subsidies that it should not have. In other words, they kind of broke the law by spending money that they, they didn't. Now, everybody, including my eighth grader on today's uh, U.S. history test, knows that the Congress makes the law, the executive branch implements the law. That's one way that school you know, children uh, remember how the three branches work together. And of course, the judicial branch interprets the law. So here we have an interesting example of how that works out in real life. The executive branch took the law, the PACA, and said, well, there's billions of dollars in this law allocated for subsidizing health plans that lose money. And so we're gonna subsidize them instead of have them have double digit rate increases in the various states. We're just gonna go ahead and do that because the law is not very specific about how it should be done. The House of Representatives is suing the executive branch because they say that should have been line itemed in the budget and we should have had a chance to approve it. You broke the law by spending the money without our advice and consent. Isn't that something? And so now one more time, the judicial branch is put in a position of making a decision about whether in fact the law has been broken. Um, let's see, nine, oh yeah, so I'm just about on time, 9.45. Um, let me conclude with a, a, a couple of thoughts about specifically employers. One of the numbers uh, Brett um, threw out there for individual uh, plans I think is very important. Even though the, the number of people in Georgia who now have health insurance through the exchange numbers nearly half a million, one of the most important numbers that you saw on his slides was 6,000 uh, slash 13,000. When, when people go to the exchange and buy health insurance policies and find that there's this out-of-pocket limit, that's good news because they know that the kind of catastrophic financial impact of health care uh, that was so commonplace prior to 2014 has now been really trying to narrow down. Um, having said that, whether it's a copay or a deductible or coinsurance, or some kind of uh, drug cost, many Americans who bought their health insurance on the exchanges are shocked to learn in 2014 and 2015 that those out-of-pocket limits apply to them and that $6,000 for an individual 
and $13,000 for a family is a whole lot of money. If you think about that, it's a number on a screen, 13,000 for a family, okay? And Brett even gave us a model of how you could get there with one sick family member and three healthy ones. But that's over $1,000 a month out of pocket. $1,000 a month out of pocket. That's a lot of dollars for most people who, um, who are buying health insurance for the first time. And so the reason that I focus on that is that it's likewise reflected in the way employers are increasingly uh, dealing with health insurance issue and their employees. Um, Mercer put out, a, not Mercer University, but William Mercer, the consulting firm, put out a study earlier this year that shows more and more employers are shifting the cost of health care uh, to their employees. There are out-of-pocket limits on that, but there's also an incentive for employers to do that in the form of taxes that uh, most of y'all are paying if you're in uh, larger businesses. And for those, as he mentioned on one of his slides, for those of y'all who are 51 to 99, taxes will be a part of your calculation on how to handle health insurance with your employees starting in 2016. I'm not sure, uh, Kit, how many members of the chamber are small, small businesses, less than 50 full-time employees, but it's also noteworthy to, to um, state that for those small employees, two to 49, em the employer penalty doesn't come into play for you. You're not gonna have to um, decide whether to offer health insurance to your employees and what kind based on government regulation, but I think the market is likewise moving. Many employees, especially in this day and age, shop for a job based on the benefits that are provided, not just the salary. And so it's important to kind of keep that in mind that as you look at the individual uh, marketplace and recognize the financial impact that that has on your employees there um, and the fact that if you're over 51 uh, full-time employees, you may be looking at taxes over here to try and strike that balance so that your folks are able to afford the coverage, whether it's individual or uh, employee, I'm sorry, employer uh, sponsored health insurance is gonna be a real challenge. And luckily there are folks here in the room and here in the community that can help you do that. Um, I've reached the end of my time. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. I appreciate it. It's good to see you all again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks Rich, that was really...